Welcome to the Madison Grand Rounds and the annual Kendrick Lecture. This visiting professorship was started, uh, Wayne died in 1999, I think the first was in 2000, and was started to honor the life and career of, of an extraordinary man who's a nephrologist, has been gone now for several years. I know many of you do not know Wayne, but I think it's important for us to celebrate the principles of his life. This lectureship was started by the nephrology community here at, at uh, Vida. We, um, it is generously funded and supported by the Kendrick family. Um, and we feel it's important every year to celebrate the, the characteristics of Wayne's life. He had an incredible impact on this institution. I think the most important impact to note is that both of his sons, are, or two of his sons, are here. Uh, Bill is here this morning. I think Scott may be off into the hinterlands, but here last night. Uh, and I know my two children will not go into nephrology, so I, I think that speaks uh, volumes about his impact. Wayne was a pioneer. As many of you know, my father was one of the uh, very first patients on dialysis in the United States. There were four centers in the United States where he get dialysis, and I know how far my father went to get it. And Wayne and his colleague Al Ferguson uh, brought uh, dialysis as part of the country years and years ago. Wayne were, uh, was certainly old school. I think everybody that knew Wayne will. I see a few smiles in the audience. I don't know if my wife made it, but she used to have all kinds of stories to tell about Wayne. And he was old school. He believed he owned his patients. He didn't believe in the term baton passes. When Wayne went home and somebody was in the hospital, he still felt responsibility for his patients. He had extraordinary uh, connectivity with his patient. And yet, he embraced the future. Wayne was the first chair of the Utilization Management Committee at this hospital. I can remember him and Deborah Davis saying things in the 1990s that today we're dealing with with the ACA. So he was very forward thinking despite being very firmly grounded and being uh, old school. And from a personal standpoint, the thing that I remember the most about Wayne was his word. Um, I actually got in trouble about that, and, and Randy, our speaker today, would uh, introduce him in a moment, remembers many of those conversations with Wayne. Uh, there, were, there were no contracts, there were no lawyers involved, it was a handshake, and it was his word, and it, it meant a great deal. And, and Years after his death, I, I, uh, there was all these things going on, and people said, where's the contract? Well, we didn't have one. We just agreed that's what we're going to do. So I really miss Wayne. I, I think this institution uh, has benefited greatly from him and greatly appreciate uh, Scott and you, Bill, for supporting this over the years and keeping his spirit alive here. It's very important. This lectureship has become all about connectivity. Um, our uh, first speaker uh, in, in 2000, uh, uh, actually trained uh, 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 Wayne, and um, we went on to have some surprises with connectivity. I remember when Tom DeVos came, and, and uh, lo and behold, found out that Tom and your mom went to high school together or something in Gadsden, Georgia, as I recall, or at Gadsden, Alabama, forgive me. And it has um, been a series of connections over the years with people. And so it is today that our speaker uh, knows Wayne, practice with Wayne, spent a great deal of time here with us. Uh, I'm not going to steal um, uh, Melanie's thunder of introducing our speaker. I'm just going to say, Randy, it's always a joy to have you back here. I, uh, Randy was here for several years. He, he was uh, pulled to the evil institution to the west of us. Um, what, what was the Carolina score this year in the football game? I, I'm blocking. Yeah. blocking on that. Um, I, I, I'm, I, actually, I know you were. I, I'm sure you were. If it had been basketball, it would been a different story, though. I know that as well. Good to have you back, Randy. That's all I'm going to say. And appropriately, I'm going to turn the, uh, the introduction of him over to Melanie Hames. Randy w built our fellowship program here. Melanie was his first fellow, and now she runs the fellowship program. So, again, a lot of great connectivity. So, Melanie. So Dr. Boland just stole my thunder. He told you everything I was going to say. Um, so after completing medical school at Ohio State University, uh, our guest speaker today moved to North Carolina. And at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, he completed his internal medicine residency, his chief resident year, and his nephrology fellowship. 
as any good senior fellow would do for a former senior fellow would do for his former junior fellow uh, dr bolin recruited dr randy detweiler to greenville to join the ecu nephrology faculty so randy came here he and dr bolin had a vision of starting a nephrology fellowship program and in 2000 that dream was realized and as Dr. Boland told you, Randy was the first program director here for Nephrology Fellowship, and I was lucky enough to be his first fellow. In 2002, Randy returned to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He wasted no time in starting a transplant fellowship program there, and he continues on in his role as director of the transplant fellowship program, as director of transplantation at Chapel Hill, and also as professor of medicine. There is no better uh, teacher or mentor than Randy Detweiler. So I look out in the audience, I know not everybody in this room loves nephrology, <laughs> but, but you're in for a treat today. I told Randy there is nothing he could get up here and say today that we wouldn't enjoy. I think Dr. Kendrick would be very pleased that Randy's back here in Greenville, uh, and please welcome Randy Detweiler. Thank you, uh, Paul and Melanie, for that introduction. I, uh, I feel like I've come home. Uh, I've been gone 12 years, but it doesn't, really doesn't seem that way. And it's good to see all these familiar faces, all my friends. I'll forever be grateful to you for recruiting me to come here. Um, and for Carl Heisch for teaching me transplant. And seeing my uh, former fellows uh, be so successful, uh, Dr. Jern again from uh, UNC, and then Dr. Hames and Dr. Cristiano from here. Um, I'm especially proud and honored to be here for the Wayne Kendrick Lectureship. Um, so when I came here, I was uh, at the beginning of my career, in formative years, so to speak, and, um, and I was confident but not really knowledgeable. And I think uh, Wayne Kendrick uh, was an example for Dr. Bolin and for me. Uh, he was an experienced, hardworking, uh, patient care oriented, outstanding physician in every way, an outstanding human being. And um, this is a unique place. You have university people working side by side with, uh, with private practice people. And Wayne, and, and it always worked. Uh, we shared the unit, uh, he made things work, uh, and he was really an example for us as to how to be leaders and how to put the patient first take really good care of, of people and, and everything else will follow thereafter. So um, I'm especially happy to be here with this lectureship under his name. Um, I hope he would be happy to know that I'm talking about transplant from an internist perspective because first and foremost, we're all internists. And, uh, and I was an internist before I was a trans, uh, nephrologist and a nephrologist before a transplant nephrologist. And what I find is in transplant nephrology, I now do a lot of general internal medicine. And so that's kind of what I'm going to focus on today. Um, if I can find the clicker. There. I'm sorry, Hunter, this is not the left button I'm supposed to advance it. There we go. So, thank you. Regardless of specialty, you're going to see transplant patients. You're going to especially see patients with end stage kidney disease. And uh, you see here this map. And what you'll notice from this map is how much kidney disease is in our part of the country, okay? And how many, how many dollars are spent on kidney disease in the, the southeastern region of the United States? <coughs> They say one in nine patients has CKD and, and, and 900,000 in North Carolina have CKD. We have the ninth highest rate of CKD in the U.S. and the fifth highest ESRD cost in the United States. Um, and Eastern North Carolina in particular has a lot of, has a higher prevalence of, uh, of kidney disease in general. <clears throat> 
Kidney transplant is the most cost-effective way and also the, the best quality of life fashion to treat end-stage kidney disease. And you can see here, hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis versus transplant, what the costs are, and a large part of this cost is obtained through reduced uh, hospital days and admissions. The entire, the six percent of the entire Medicare budget is d dedicated to end-stage kidney disease treatment. And so, the more people we can transplant, the more we save on the Medicare budget. And for any individual person, you can see that you save large amounts of money uh, for the system by getting them a transplant. But that's not the reason we do transplants. We do it to help their quality of life and to make them live longer. And you can see here a comparison of mortality rates for dialysis patients, for listed dialysis patients, which is probably a better comparison group, for transplant patients, and then for patients once they fail their transplant. And so you can see that there's a major mortality advantage to uh, getting a transplant. And we want to keep that kidney working because the first year going back to dialysis after transplant is a high morbidity and mortality year. Uh, so keeping the kidney working as long as possible is important. And in fact, they are lasting a long time and survival rates are getting better. You can see here for living donor transplants, we're looking about a 13-year uh, half-life and for deceased donor kidney transplants, somewhere around 10 years. And so that's pretty good. Um, the majority of that improvement over time is related to reduced rejection rates and you can see this line, over time rejection rates have declined and increased one year graph survival. So that when I was a fellow, is right around the time when uh, we got some new medications, specifically cyclosporin, uh, that allowed one year graph survival to significantly improve. The consequence of this is patients are living longer with kidney disease so the, the, the number of transplant patients out there is growing exponentially. We as transplant nephrologists cannot take care of all of these people. Uh, we, we try and we have a lot of medical care that we deliver to them, but in the end, we need the help of our internal medicine colleagues to do their primary care uh, as well as uh, obviously specialty care for this group of patients. So graft survival has improved over time predominantly because we've lost fewer kidneys. Unfortunately, we've impacted the, uh, the mortality or the, the number of, of deaths has really stayed about the same. Um, this mortality advantage applies basically to every age group, um, but the delta or so-called uh, advantage of transplant as far as life years is greatest for the younger patients. Um, but even for the, uh, the much older patients, you can see that compared to dialysis, there's a significant uh, uh, life survival <coughs> advantage to getting transplant. Um, so the question is, uh, you know, we aren't impacting uh, mortality rates that much after transplant. Well, why why are our patients with transplants dying? Well, predominantly, and if death with functioning graft is now as common as losing the graft to other causes, why are patients dying? Well, it's what one might expect, infection, malignancy, and particularly cardiovascular disease. So I'll just turn now and talk a little bit about cardiovascular disease after kidney transplant. So you can see here, this is a, uh, a figure that looks at the uh, mortality rates uh, from uh, cardiovascular disease in the general population versus transplant versus dialysis patients. And note especially this scale over here. So this is kind of a logarithmic scale. So there are huge differences in cardiovascular mortality for dialysis patients versus the general population. And even though transplant gives an advantage from a cardiovascular standpoint, it doesn't approach the general population especially for the young. And so cardiovascular mortality in the young is a, a particular problem for our patients. And there's some atypical nature to this cardiovascular disease. Uh, we th usually think of cardiovascular disease as predominantly an atherosclerotic process. Um, 
but really a lot of the cardiovascular mortality and, and probably the increase, the, one of the leading causes of death in our patients is arrhythmias. Uh, and that's especially true for young patients. And rather than atherosclerosis, what a lot of this is related to is LVH diastolic dysfunction and hypertension related disease. We also see a very high prevalence of pulmonary hypertension in our patients. And the vascular changes are not, not the same in CKD patients as they are in, uh, in other patients with cardiovascular disease. There's some combination of both atherosclerosis and this process we call medial artery calcification, where there's ca calcium deposits within the, the lumen or within the uh, wall of the, uh, of the vessel, but not necessarily narrowing of the lumen of the vessel. And so our patients have stiff calcified vessels that sometimes if you get an x-ray, it almost shows up like an arteriogram, even in the absence of contrast dye. Um, and that has its consequences, as one might imagine, on the various uh, pressures w into which the heart is pumping. Uh, and consequently, pulmonary hypertension, diastolic dysfunction, and arrhythmia potential. So it's, not all, it's also not surprising that the risk factors for cardiovascular disease uh, uh, post-transplant aren't exactly the same as they are in the general population. Now, it's smoking, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and hyperlipidemia still impact cardiovascular risk. There's no question about that. But if you plug the values for those into the Framingham formulas, we, it way underestimates cardiovascular uh, risk and mortality in, in the dialysis and the transplant population. And it correlates somewhat more even with uh, elevated systolic blood pressure, increased pulse pressure, <laughs> Again, stiff vessels, left ventricular hypertrophy, and interestingly also the level of kidney function. So the worse the kidney function, the more likely there is to be cardiovascular mortality problems. There are also these non-traditional risk factors that patients without kidney disease don't have. More proteinuria increases cardiovascular risk. For kidney transplants, reduced uh, function of the uh, kidney or acute rejection and then homocysteine, uric acid, hyperphosphatemia, and interestingly also malignancy and, and duration of pretransplant dialysis impacts uh, mortality rates. This is something we call the vintage effect for transplant, and it shows that the longer a patient is on dialysis prior to transplant, the lower their post-transplant uh, uh, graft survival. In other words, combination of death or loss of the graft the longer they're on dialysis, the worse they do. So if you have a living donor preemptive transplant or a deceased donor preemptive transplant, this is, by the way, exceedingly rare. Um, the, uh, and even preemptive living donor transplants are making up well less than 5% of the total transplants done. There's a significant mortality advantage. And probably part of it is not having some of those risk factors because you've corrected their kidney function. Blood pressure control may get better. Phosphorus control gets better, and there's less, uh, less cardiovascular consequences. Um, unfortunately, for our patients, we're really not seeing big increases in the number of transplants. The deceased donor numbers have really plateaued over the past several years. Living donation, if anything, has almost dipped. Uh, and so even though we have more and more patients that qualify for a transplant and more and more patients with end-stage kidney disease, the total number of organs is not increasing. And so consequently, we just keep seeing the waiting time get longer and longer. Waiting time is not the same in every area of the country. You can see in North Carolina, we have one of the longer waiting times. Um, we end up quoting patients three to five year waiting time uh, for waiting for a deceased donor kidney transplant. So obviously it's best for that patient if preemptive transplant and reduced dialysis time is, is good for their overall uh, long-term well-being to try to get them a living donor transplant where possible. Okay. If you do not have a living donor though, we want to list them as soon as the rules allow. And so one of the things I want everybody to take away today here is that UNOS allows listing for deceased donors when the GFR hits 20, okay? And if you wait to list your patient when they are on dialysis, 
that's too late for that patient. Okay, uh, there's a, the especially for diseases like polycystic kidney disease that progress very slowly. Uh, we've done a lot of preemptive PKD kidney transplants because the rate of progression is slow enough to allow that to to occur. Um, but obviously, if you know. Even, that that's not going to happen very often that you're going to get a preemptive deceased, or deceased donor transplant. So what we also look at is how can we improve living donation rates? Well, one of the things we need to do is dispel myths about living donation. Um, I'm not really talking that much about living donation today, but in general, uh, mortality rates probably CKD rates are not impacted by donating a kidney. If hypertension occurs after donating a kidney, we're looking at only a small change, maybe three to five points on hypertension. It's a relatively small impact as far as those outcomes. For young donors, uh, for females, there is probably an increased risk of preeclampsia, which is something that we tell our patients. Uh, so that is something that factor in when you're looking for, for who can be a donor. But in the end, sometimes uh, our patients don't have a donor. Uh, or they have donors that are not ABO compatible. So another option that can be tried is kidney paired donation, and I know you just did a kidney paired donation transplant here. This particularly works for recipients who are not sensitized and who have, uh, or at least not highly sensitized, and have non-A blood group, if, or non-O blood group. If they have an O blood group, then uh, sometimes the best option at that point is to do an ABO incompatible transplant. Outcomes for ABO incompatible transplant are, are really relatively close to ABO compatible transplant if it's done with plasma phoresis prior to transplantation. So this barrier that previously existed for living donor transplant seems to be going away between paired donation and ABO incompatible transplant. We believe that this is option one this is option two for people who have ABO incompatibility uh, or HLA incompatibility with ABO incompatibility. The other thing is should we accept higher risk living donors? If anything, we try to err on the side of protecting the donor. Uh, we do not want to put them in harm's way, but some centers, I'm sorry, I keep hitting the forward button when I'm trying to hit the, the, the uh, pointer, but Older age donors, hypertensive donors, obese donors, these are things that uh, some centers are considering. We're still relatively, I think, conservative uh, looking at this, but um, it, it is something to uh, consider in some individuals. Um, cardiac risk, as I said before, is highly influenced by kidney function, okay? And you can see here that for a kidney transplant, the creatinine that that person is at at the end of one year impacts not just graft survival, and you could have the similar figure like this, and there are similar figures like this for graft survival, but part of that graft survival disadvantage is that patients are dying of cardiovascular disease, okay? So having a creatinine of one is better for your heart than having a creatinine of two and a half, okay? Um, and so it's, so we are, uh, obligated, so to speak, to try to get their kidney function as good as we possibly can, which obviously we're going to do. Uh, this again, though, speaks to why living donation is a better option for patients, because they tend to get a better serum creatinine than kidneys off the waiting list, especially if they are older kidneys. Um, so how do we keep their kidney function good, okay? well. One of the things that has been thought about for a long time is the drugs we use are nephrotoxic. Cyclosporin, tacrolimus are nephrotoxic agents. This study in Australia was done where they biopsied patients every year after, after a kidney pancreas transplant and looked to see what the pathology looked like. And what they did is they called uh, calcineurin inhibitor nephrotoxicity by 10 years in virtually every patient, okay? That was based upon findings like this, where there was nodular uh, hyalinosis, 
Some patients have segmental glomerulosclerosis or striped fibrosis and tubular atrophy. A new study has come out called the DCAF study that is suggesting that what we believe to be true might not necessarily be true about calcineurin inhibitors, okay? And some question whether calcineurin inhibitors are causing a lot of these lesions. They found similar lesions in patients who weren't even on calcineurin inhibitors, for instance, and zero-hour biopsies will often give these same types of findings. And we're moving away from thinking that calcineurin inhibitors are causing nephrotoxicity or poisoning our kidney, so to speak, and thinking more about another mechanism by which grafts are being chronically lost. And that is alloimmune-mediated injury. And I will say that this institution, uh, through Lorita Rebellato and uh, collaboration with Paul Tarasaki and Dr. Bolin was involved, and a number of people involved finding out that one of the key features in predicting long-term kidney function and uh, loss of the graft is whether or not a patient develops antibodies to the transplant kidney. Anti-HLA antibodies that we term donor-specific antibodies. And what that causes is this pathology. And this pathology is a C4D deposition where complement is de deposited in the peritubular capillaries. So this is a, a little capillary next to a renal tubule that has complement de uh, complement degradation products, C4D, deposited there. And if you look at this capillary, you will see that there's damage to this capillary wall. And what's happening is that the antibodies are attacking the little capillaries within the glomerulus. In addition, uh, there are chronic vascular changes that are occurring in bigger blood vessels that are alloimmune mediated. And many believe that the bigger problem is not calcineurin inhibitor nephrotoxicity, but rather that we are getting chronic alloimmune mediated injury over time. That causes loss of graft function, causes some people to go back to dialysis, and increases their cardiovascular risk all things that are disadvantageous to our patients. There's also a glomerular lesion that tends to go with alloimmune injury. When I, was a, when I was a young faculty member, it was believed that CMV caused this lesion. Well, now we know that it's probably mediated by uh, anti-HLA antibodies. And um, so what you get with this is transplant glomerulopathy, and it almost looks like a uh, membranoproliferative type lesions sometime. There's this du duplication of the glomerular basement membrane. Proteinuria develops. If patients get transplant glomerulopathy either through cell-mediated events or alloantibody-mediated events, they tend to have a poor prognosis. So between peritubular capillary changes and transplant glomerulopathy and development of uh, anti-HLA antibodies, some patients uh, end up with gradual loss of their kidney function. And you can see this here. This is recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. If patients get donor-specific antibodies, they do much worse than if they don't get them. As a matter of fact, if you're looking, this is years after transplant. If you get a transplant and you don't get a DSA and you don't die of something else, there's a very good chance that kidney is going to last a very, very long time. And again, this goes against the idea that calcineurin inhibitors are the things causing loss of that kidney function. Uh, it more is, is antibody-mediated events. Not all antibodies are the same. So you can see that you know, it still is less than 50% are losing their allograft, even if they have DSAs. Some patients with donor-specific antibodies get absolutely no apparent clinical consequence. They have no proteinuria. They have no, none of the pathology changes that we see. Why this is, people are trying to figure out. This recently published paper suggests that if, an, if a DSA uh, binds complement, it is a more destructive type of DSA than if it doesn't bind complement. And so, again, not all DSAs are equal. And unfortunately, this is not yet available uh, to all of us uh, to, to, uh, to check. But I think this is potentially an important uh, um, thing to, that we'll be looking at in the future. So 
We're trying to preserve kidney function. We're trying to get them transplanted as quickly as we can. Uh, but in the end, uh, you know, we can only do so much on, on both of those uh, uh, scales, so to speak. Uh, so what we really need to also do simultaneous to that is deal with this issue of, uh, of hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia, the traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, the drugs we use cause this problem. This is a bigger problem than the nephrotoxicity they cause. It's the vascular disease that is being induced by cyclosporin and prograf and prednisone. MMF doesn't tend to cause these. Sirolimus was going to be the drug that didn't cause hypertension and replaced cyclosporin and intact. We now find that sirolimus causes proteinuria. Sirolimus is definitely worse as far as hyperlipidemia. And now we know that sirolimus also causes diabetes, something we didn't know initially. And everolimus, a new drug, is, is uh, similarly causing problems with these cardiovascular risks. There's a new drug that got approved called Belatacep that does not cause hypertension, diabetes, or hyperlipidemia. Um, and that's something that we'll talk about in a bit. But so we're now in this dilemma, okay? So if alloantibodies are attacking the kidney, then we need more immunosuppression. But if more immunosuppression is making cardiovascular risk profiles worse, then maybe we need less immunosuppression. Um, and there probably is some nephrotoxicity to the agents still as well, even though I think it's a lesser part of the problem than the antibodies. So how do we address this dilemma? Well, we need to modify these risk factors as best we can. And that's where everybody here gets involved. Treat their diabetes well, treat their hypertension, treat, uh, um, treat their other cardiovascular risk factors. Or could we also think about altering immunosuppression? So about 35% of the country uses a prednisone-free regimen. There is potentially some consequence to that from an immune perspective. And we are a prednisone-free center, but I worry about it. This is what keeps me up at night thinking about, is this allowing that low-grade uh, immune-mediated injury to hit our patients, or are we really having an advantage by having less cardiovascular risk? I already talked about sirolimus and everolimus and how they really haven't panned out, and now they are used in less than 5% of patients. And then there's this new agent called belatacept. And what belatacept is, is it is a co-stimulatory blocker. So this is an antigen-presenting cell, a T cell. Signal one is where the T cell receptor um, meets the HLA complex of the antigen-presenting cell. You need signal one and signal two to activate the nucleus to make pro-inflammatory cytokines to get the cell cycle engaged for T cell proliferation to start the rejection process. If you block this signal, then you can potentially uh, reduce the likelihood that, uh, that T cell mediated rejection is ongoing. And if you get T cells activated, it recruits B cells and then that makes antibodies. And so potentially Belatacep can be a good thing for our patients. Uh, this was FDA approved in 2011. It is a CTLA-4 fusion protein. CTLA-4 is a, the blocker of that interaction of signal two that I just talked about. The major advantage here, again, no blood pressure problems, lipid problems, or glucose problems, and definitely no nephrotoxicity. The problem is it's IV, but at least it's only about every two to four weeks, depending upon what stage you are post-transplant and is it extremely expensive? And this has actually been the biggest barrier I have had to getting some patients who don't tolerate calcineurin inhibitors to move to Belatacept, okay? The other problem is benefit is the study that was done uh, with using Belatacept. And if you look at the five-year follow-up, GFR is definitely better, as one might expect. There's not calcineurin inhibitor effects potentially on the kidney, and graft and, and patient outcomes seem to not be that different, but unfortunately rejection rates were significantly higher 
And the second problem was is that there was higher rates of post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. And this actually delayed approval of the drug for quite some time, the, the PTLD risk. And there's a black box warning that you should never use uh, Belatacept in an EBV naive patient who's getting an EBV positive kidney. We have several patients on Belatacept because we've participated in about four different clinical trials. And I will say it is a really good drug. You cannot use it without prednisone. Patients will reject if you use it without prednisone. And I still am unclear if the mortality and cardiovascular risk profile advantage is uh, outweighs the potential disadvantage of these two factors, and I think time will tell. Nobody's confident enough in this to turn their entire center over to Belatacept, but this is where we need to go. We, need, we don't need more effective drugs to prevent rejection. We have very effective drugs for that. We need as effective a drugs that do not have the toxicities that our current regimen has, okay? But that's not where we're at, okay? These are our common regimens, and you can see right down the line, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia still comes up. And if you're, unless you're MMF prednisone Bella, it's gonna be at least two plus signs as far as severity. Some of them are worse than others. This right here is the most commonly utilized regimen in the United States, MMF plus, plus prednisone plus, plus prograph. So we need to manage our patients with hypertension. Obviously, everybody wants to do that. We target uh, blood pressures of about 130 over 80. There's no data saying that should be the target. A lot of the things we do are taken from the data that comes from treating CKD. And in many ways, I think of a transplant patient as a CKD patient with a twist, an immunosuppressive twist, so to speak. Um, calcium channel blockers have a potential advantage in that the vasoconstriction induced by tacrolimus or cyclosporin can be counteracted, but realize that verapamil and diltiazem will raise uh, drug levels of the calcineurin inhibitors as well as sirolimus. We, so we intend to use amlodipine uh, more than nifedipine. The problem here is that, as you know, the patients can get edema. They also get gingival hyperplasia, especially if they're on the combination of cyclosporin and, and uh, amlodipine or nifedipine. Beta blockers presumably would be a good thing. Our patients are cardiovascular, have high, high cardiovascular risk. They should get beta blockers. They should also probably get aspirin. Unfortunately, we don't have studies that prove that this is true. We just assume it's true and this is what we do. What about ACE inhibitors? Most transplant patients are not on an ACE inhibitor, despite what I just said, that we think of them as having CKD, okay? Well, why is that? Um, well, they probably, most of them should be on an ACE inhibitor. Here you see a retrospective study looking at patients who got an ACE inhibitor versus not getting an ACE inhibitor, and it was retrospective, but they're in a large patient population there was an, a, an advantage as far as graft survival to getting an ACE inhibitor. And from our CKD knowledge, this should not surprise anybody. Um, so that the 10-year actual graft survival was impacted. Showing something that has an impact on graft survival in transplant is really significant because it takes a lot of years and outcomes are so good that it, it, to show an actual effect is not necessarily easy. So to see this makes me think that we should use ACE inhibitors more, but we need to use them with caution, and I think everybody knows about these potential impacts. The one we often don't think about is anemia. This is how we treat post-transplant erythrocytosis is with an ACE inhibitor. So it also can cause anemia, and our, our immunosuppressive medications suppress the bone marrow, and so that can you know exacerbate that problem. The other thing is, when we think of patients that might have a tendency to vascular disease and they only have a single kidney, we're often hesitant to put that person on an ACE inhibitor. Well, the transplant is obviously a single kidney model and they can get renal artery stenosis. So if you put somebody on an ACE inhibitor, you have to check labs within seven to 10 days. It's not like other patients where it might be two weeks to a month. I try to check their, their uh, serum creatinine within at least seven to 10 days. What about lipids? Well, we do have a randomized controlled trial of lipid treatment 
in transplant patients. It's called the ALERT study. At five years, they had trouble showing a, a separation, but by seven years, there was a clear advantage of using fluvastatin uh, as opposed to placebo in kidney transplant recipients. And fluvastatin is not one of our particularly potent statins, okay? Um, so statin use has now become commonplace in transplant recipients. One of the problems is that not all statins are the same and there can be potential problems in picking a statin. Some of them need to be adjusted for a level of kidney function. Fluvastatin, pravastatin, and atorvastatin do not have this requirement, okay? Some of them have uh, increased uh, lip lipophilicity and there's some advantage of being less lip lipophilic and fluvastatin and pravastatin and atorvastatin, so a common theme here, have less lipophilicity and then there's this problem with the cytochrome P453A4 interactions with many of the drugs, which makes them prone to rhabdomyolysis, myopathy, other potential consequences, including liver problems. And fluvastatin and pravastatin do not affect this. So that I pick typically pravastatin or sometimes atorvastatin. I think they're more effective than fluvastatin, but I tried not to use the other uh, statins unless I use it at lower doses, particularly because of this problem with, with many of the statins, okay? Um, if you use these other drugs, you again, you need to really reduce the dose. There's now a black box warning out about using simvastatin with cyclosporin, and I'd suggest not doing that. Um, and, the, you know, pick one of these and go with it and monitor them for liver issues and muscle issues. What about hyperlipidemia uh, uh, options that are not the statins? Well, really there's not any study that has shown safety and there are a lot of potential consequences of this. Zetamibe has been looked at, um, but if you combine it, you know, with uh, simvastatin, that can be a real problem and I had a patient end up in the ICU because they basically got severe rhabdomyolysis and renal failure and major problems using a combination of azetamibe, simvastatin, and a calcineurin inhibitor. The fibrates sim similarly have rhabdomyolysis risk. Niacin is often not easily tolerated. Uh, the problem with the bile acid sequestrants is they also sequester some of our drugs and that's not cool. Um, and then uh, fish oil, there just isn't much data on that. What about post-transplant diabetes? <clears throat> so 20 to 30 percent of all transplant patients have diabetes going in. By three years, another 20 to 25 percent will develop diabetes. So half our patients either have diabetes or are going to get diabetes. Again, do we need another drug? Because tacrolimus is more associated with new onset diabetes than are the other calcineurin inhibitors and other drug regimens. Um, this effect is lessened if you can do steroid-free regimens. And this is, again, part of the reason we've chosen to go steroid-free at UNC, um, with the caveat that there is potentially some concern of what that's doing to their um, to their immune-mediated graft injury. Um, and if they get new onset diabetes, it's a bad thing for that patient, as one might imagine. So if you don't get diabetes after transplant, this is kind of like the DSA line that I showed earlier. They tend to do well. But if they do get no DAT or new onset diabetes after transplant, look at the cumulative survival. I mean, this is a huge difference. So reducing the likelihood of getting diabetes is an important thing, and, and um, one of the ways we try to accomplish that is by uh, getting patients to lose weight, uh, having them follow a healthy lifestyle uh, as best they can, and then thinking about is there an option for uh, addressing the, the calcineurin inhibitors with an alternative agent or, or potentially minimizing some of the dosages in some particularly at-risk patient populations. 
uh, the, the patients who already look like they might have metabolic syndrome, for instance. The, the calcineurin inhibitors cause diabetes through a couple of different ways. They do induce insulin resistance, but there's also a reduction in insulin production, and that's important to know. It's interesting we use Prograf for pancreas transplants, or tacrolimus for pancreas transplants, yet there is a reduction in insulin uh, production. And you see here the mechanisms. That's not as important probably as just knowing that this can happen. Okay, so I'm thinking about these patients as having insulin resistance and reduced insulin production. And so as a consequence, many of our, our transplant patients, once they do develop diabetes, we will go very quickly to, to using insulin therapy. Um, whoops, sorry. The, the other oral agents have uh, often limited uh, uh, study evidence, or they have limited study evidence of efficacy, and they have, as we all know, a lot of potential disadvantages. The one I'd like to just kind of think about most is metformin or the biguanides, which I think we probably underutilize in our post-transplant population because we're concerned about the possibility of them having lactic acidosis. Uh, as long as their kidney function is stable, that's a really rare event. And I really believe that metformin for, for transplant patients with good kidney function is a very good option. And what I would suggest is that the, you know, the advantages outweigh this small risk of lactic acidosis. Um, and I don't like to use it in the first six months when they could get an acute rejection. But once they get to a more stable level of renal function, and I know I have an adherent patient, I'll uh, often transition them to, uh, or add metformin to their regimen if they have existing diabetes pre-transplant or they're developing post-transplant hyperglycemia. Uh, and I didn't finish this slide, avoid if the GFR is less than 30. So I would not give it to anybody with an estimated GFR of less than 30. Okay, so we've talked a lot about cardiovascular risk. Remember that figure that showed mortality rates are, or mortality is affected by cancer, infection, and cardiovascular disease. By the way, transplant affords a fourfold advantage in reduced cardiovascular mortality. It offers a fourfold advantage in reduced um, mortality from infection. So despite being on immunosuppression, infection death rates are lower by a lot in transplant recipients. What's not lower is cancer, okay? But interestingly, cancer death rates are no higher than they are for dialysis patients. And I believe the reason for that is because the nephrologists and all the people helping them are, know this problem and are really under tight surveillance looking for cancer in this patient population. You see here, though, what we have to think about and deal with. So some of these cancers are happening at risk ratios that are huge. Even the common ones that we often think about as not necessarily occurring with higher rates, breast cancer, prostate cancer, probably do happen at higher rates than, than the general population. But non-melanoma skin cancer, Kaposi, sarcoma, especially in other parts of the world, lymphoma, uterine cervical, vulvovaginal cancer, all of these cancers happen at much higher rates than the general population. So if you look at this, it's interesting that this is also the subgroup that has an infectious link to malignancy, okay? So, it's, so part of the problem is we're suppressing the immune system and viruses are increasing the risk of cancer risk in our patients. So EBV is associated with lymphoma and nasopharyngeal cancer. HHV-8 is Kaposi, sarcoma, and possibly non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. HPV is the big problem, okay? This is where we get our problems with skin cancer uh, and oral cancers, but also uh, GYN malignancies are HPV-related. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit later, but this is why all young women should get HPV, HPV vaccinated while they have CKD, before they get transplanted, when their immune system can respond better to vaccinations. Hep B and Hep C are associated with hepatomas, HTLV1 with T-cell lymphoma. And then there's a new polyomavirus that just got identified that's also associated with a Merkel cell skin cancer. 
Uh, that one happens at like several thousand times higher, and we now find out it's one of the, it's a polyoma virus that's not BK virus. So the absolute cancer risk after transplant, uh, we, we looked at relative risk, but the absolute risk is, is higher for prostate, even though it's not as high on the relative risk scale, just because it's much more common, okay? So our patients are getting all of these cancers everybody else gets, and then higher rates of some others. It's estimated about 7.5% of patients by three years will have a skin cancer and another 75 will have a non-skin cancer. Um, skin cancer patients, um, uh, it represents half of all malignancies. By 20 years in the non-African American population, most people are getting it. They're mainly squamous cells more than basal cells, but they can obviously get both of them. And this is what our patients look like. They have this, what we call field cancerization process. In places they've had sun injury, they'll just keep getting these skin lesions. And they really need to follow with Dr. Burke and all the dermatologists very closely to not end up with uh, you know, losing large areas of skin or potentially even get a met getting metastatic problems. Post-transplant renal cancers happen at a much higher rate as well. We do yearly ultrasounds to address that issue. But then the, the big issue I've already talked about is the genital neoplasias, and I just can't emphasize enough the importance of vaccination for HPV and also yearly uh, GYN exams. And then uh, uh, also just doing good cancer surveillance. So mammograms, pap smears, prostate exams, colonoscopies, skin exams. Every patient I see in transplant clinic, one of the problems I write as, their, as a problem is cancer screening. And I make sure that they're getting all of these things, uh, to, and, and I think that impacts, hopefully, their long-term survival. Just say a word quickly about vaccines. Again, transplant, before they are transplanted, give them HPV. And also varicella uh, vaccine or, or Zostavax should be given prior to transplant if, and pneumococcal vaccine prior to transplant. Obviously, everybody should get yearly influenza vaccines. The reason you need to give them the Varivax or the Zostavax prior to transplant is you cannot give live vaccines to a kidney recipient. Okay, you cannot do that. So this is actually an, an important slide. Don't give them Varivax or Zostavax probably shouldn't give them the intranasal influenza vaccine, can't give them MMR or OPV, and then if they're traveling, if somebody says they're leaving the country and they need vaccinations, make sure they're not getting yellow fever vaccine because that's a live vaccine. Okay, I'm just gonna skip over that because I wanna make sure and leave enough time for questions. Uh, well, actually, I will just say this. One of the things, whenever you start a new drug, Think about how it affects cytochrome P450. And if it does, it's going to affect TAC and cyclosporine levels. So any new drug you start, you have to think about that. And I really just want to impress upon you how big this list is of this CYP3A uh, inhibitors and inducers. And you don't need to know everything on that list unless you're a nephrology fellow going to take the boards. <laughs> and then you better know everything on that list, okay, because that that is the board question. That's half the board questions, is, is this right here. So take a picture of that. <laughs> Except I think pictures are not allowed in, in uh, these talks because it's all recorded already. Anyway, um, the other thing, remember, if you put somebody on allopurinol, make sure they're not on Aza, or you will wipe out their bone marrow. Okay, and I've seen that happen. There's a drug interaction there that does that. The other thing is, when you're looking at dosages of cell sept, look to see if they're on cyclosporine versus TAC, because the enterohepatic circulation is interfered with by cyclosporine for MMF. You need more cell sept or myfortic if a patient's on cyclosporine than you do if they're on TAC. 500 of TAC equals 750 if you're on cyclosporine, okay? So those are about the equivalent dosages probably. This is an interesting thing that comes up a lot. So patients come in, they have diarrhea, their creatinine's up, they're dehydrated, we get a TAC level, it's 16, 
and we think it's because they just took their med or something. But it's often because they have increased absorption of TAC. And there's a protein called the P-glycoprotein that is an efflux protein that basically kicks TAC, tacrolimus out it back into the lumen of the GI tract. And if the GI tract is, is in any way injured, like from, for instance, a viral infection, that efflux protein might not work properly and TAC levels can rise. So you have the combination of a dehydrated patient with TAC toxicity and acute kidney injury so you often have to hold doses. We see this all the time, okay? Um, and I'll just end by saying call your friendly consultant uh, or kidney coordinator with questions. Uh, I say thank you. I say thank you to you for re recruiting me here. Thanks to Carl Heisch for teaching me transplant. Thanks to my fellows, my first two fellows, and I don't know if Dr. McClawhorn's here for making me proud. Uh, thanks to my old partners, MJ's here I see, uh, I had a great nine years here. Um, I really enjoyed being here. I really enjoyed coming back. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Barshman. We do. We, we consistently do. And so, you know, that it, it's, um, so the other side of it is, we're talking cardiovascular risk. Hypertension, gout, hyperlipidemia, clearly worse with cyclosporin. And I've had to switch patients off cyclosporin to TAC because they get so many gout attacks. Um, it's believed that the, uh, that the, it, it's very difficult to prove that TAC causes less rejection. But many believe, particularly in African Americans, that the trough levels correlate better with actual drug levels or area under the curve. So that, I didn't show the, the figure, but the whole country has gone to 90% TAC and away from cyclosporine. And I think, to me, the diabetes risk uh, is balanced off by all those other risks, and I do use it in those patients. But you can kind of identify who's at risk. And this is why part of the thing that we do when we're doing recipient evaluations, if we have obese patients that are not diabetic, or patients that, you know, you kind of can almost predict who you think might be at risk, we try to get them into weight loss programs prior to transplant. Um, but I don't hesitate in using it uh, post-transplant. If somebody develops post-transplant diabetes, for, uh, for a while I would switch them to cyclosporine, thinking that might make things better. It doesn't work. I mean, I don't know what your experience, it just never seemed to work. Um, what I wonder will work is if we flip them to Bella. And that mortality disparity was huge. Now part of that is a selection bias, right? Because you know, the patients that get diabetes are probably already at higher risk of other things. So it's not entirely that they develop diabetes, but it's such a big difference that I wonder if someday, as we get more and more experience with Bella, that the diabetes prone patient, we won't choose cyclosporine over TAC, we may choose Bella over TAC. I am not ready to go down the Bella TASAP path at all, even if it was affordable, which it's not. Uh, but that is, that is, it's promising that it doesn't cause those problems. I think the lymphoma risk is way overrated, uh, but it is real and, uh, it, it, and it's potentially life-threatening. So um, anyway, that's the answer. Yeah, I, I, you know, if, if their creatinine is slowly going up, what I would say is get, make sure they've had DSAs checked. It might not be the nephrotoxicity, 
especially and and we screen very carefully for proteinuria as well. So even so, I want to see. I want to find out if they have antibody mediated problems before their creatinine goes up. I want it when they have proteinuria, or maybe even want it before they get proteinuria by periodically screening for DSAs. And I don't, I assume you, you you know you're the center of DSA checking here. Uh, I assume you're probably doing that. What people don't know is if you get a DSA and everything looks good, what you're supposed to do about it. Because I showed that one figure where a lot of them don't seem to have a problem if they have a DSA. We don't do biopsies just because they get a DSA. But I'm a little less hesitant to drop their dosing. If they start getting a creeping creatinine, in the old days I would just say, ah, chronic allograft nephropathy we used to call it. That kidney's probably slowly going to be lost. I don't believe that anymore. I, we will, when we get proteinuria or we start seeing that creatinine bump, we will biopsy them. If there's evidence of antibody mediated graft injury, then we will do a variety of things potentially, including just increasing their chronic immunosuppression. So what we sometimes do is up whatever cal calcineurin inhibitor they're on, uh, rather than uh, if it's if that's the mechanism. So Randy, I, I'm yeah. sorry I'm going to jump in on that because we're certainly struggling with that here. And, um, and I know this is medicine grand rounds, but it's a great opportunity with all the nephrologists here. We really struggle with, with what you just said. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we all increase IS. And, and I find a lot of patients where, in retrospect, you look back and say, oops, that program level of four actually meant something back right. there. You know? and, and so that, those are pretty easy. I think you just increase the program. But when you sort of played all those cards out, what do you do then? I was just being chastised by the uh, IVIG police here in the hospital before Grand Rounds. Yeah. What, what are you guys doing beyond that? So very careful surveillance for any evidence. Once they get a DSA, if they have anything at all, I biopsy them. And then I use the biopsy to guide therapy. And if there's antibody immediate rejection, we treat it with whatever armamentarium we have. If they have a DSA but there's no clinical consequence, in other words, no proteinuria, their creatinine is 1.1, uh, we just follow them very closely. I, might, I would be less prone to drop their MMF or their TAC once they get a DSA. That's my behavior. I don't know if that's right or wrong. I think we're waiting for studies to tell us what to do on this. And that this is the, the hottest area of discussion in transplant right now what to do with these DSAs. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.